This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 74, Rika Roundtree, Part 2. Last week, I told you the first part of the story of eight-year-old Rika Roundtree, who DCFS left in her father's home despite clear evidence that she was being abused. After Rika died on January 26, 2019, investigators found disturbing cell phone videos of Rika's abuse and arrested her father's girlfriend, Cindy Baker. In this episode, I'll go over the rest of Rika's story, including Cindy's trial and subsequent developments. This is the story of a sweet, kind little girl who could make anyone smile and who loved her dolls like they were her own babies. It's also the story of the failure of Illinois' Department of Children and Family Services to protect yet another vulnerable child from targeted and obvious child abuse. In next week's episode, you'll hear my conversation with Rika's mother, Anne Roundtree, who is relentless in her mission to protect other children from suffering her daughter's fate. This is part two of the horrific story of Rika Roundtree. Two things before I pick up where I left off in last week's episode. First, I'd like to thank my newest patrons, Carrie from Conroe, Texas, Megan from Round Lake, Illinois, Christina from Statesville, North Carolina, and Suzanne F. from Bikini Bottom. Thank you for your monthly pledges and for your help getting me closer to my goal of devoting myself full-time to the blog and the podcast, even after my savings account runs out. I appreciate all of you. Secondly, there are a few things I'd like to clear up from last week's episode, and I'd like to thank Rika's mom, Anne, for helping me set things straight. The first call placed to DCFS about Rika's family was in 2014, when Anne's son was seen outside holding cans, which you'll recognize as a punishment Rika later faced in her father's house. Anne said that was Richard's way to punish the children. The last DCFS visit to Anne's home took place in 2016 after her son attempted to take his own life. Anne believes Cindy Baker placed both calls. While Anne and Richard broke up for good in September of 2015, Anne later found out that Richard was actually with Cindy throughout the entirety of his eight-year relationship with Anne. I mentioned last week that Anne began using drugs by the end of 2015, but that wasn't quite accurate. At the time of her arrest in September of 2016, she was selling drugs but not using them. At that time, she had lost a very good job with a financial institution, and she only wanted to continue providing her children with the same lifestyle they had. Once Anne and her then-boyfriend, Deontay, were arrested, She asked Richard to take Rika and her older brother, Charles, because Richard was the only father Charles knew. In fact, Richard was in the process of adopting Charles as his own son when he and Anne broke up, so the adoption was not completed. By the time of Anne's arrest, he was living with Cindy, who didn't want to take in Anne's son, so Charles was sent to stay with his uncle in Minnesota. Anne only began using drugs after she was released from her 68 days in jail for the drug-dealing charges and was unable to regain custody of Rika, triggering her downward spiral. Fortunately, she is clean now. With those corrections made, I'll pick up where I left off, which was on Friday, November 15, 2019, the third day of testimony in Cindy Baker's trial. Jurors passed a box of tissues around as at least two of them became emotional and cried while watching the three videos of Rika's torture. The videos were the prosecution's final evidence in the case, and they certainly left their mark. A video from May 6, 2018, showed Rika standing behind a recliner while Cindy ordered her to go into Cindy's room, and Cindy shouted expletives at her, threatening to call her father. An August 26, 2018 video showed Cindy dragging Rika into the bedroom by her neck, 
the eight-year-old was made to strip naked, and then, wet and shivering, she was forced to hold cans of food with arms outstretched while Cindy delivered multiple aggressive slaps to Rika's naked body. At one point, Cindy asked her, Cold, aren't you? Good. When Rika's arms sagged, Cindy hit Rika in the face and yelled, Do I need to put a collar on you? She then wrapped her hands around Rika's neck. When Rika cried out, No, Cindy forcefully put her arms back in position and forced her to continue holding the cans. Text messages showed the video was shared with Richard. A video from September 26, 2018, part of which I unfortunately watched, shows Rika again holding cans facing the wall. Cindy is seen kneeing Rika in the back several times, causing the little girl to scream in pain, before Cindy eventually bangs Rika's head against the wall with a solid thud. In that video, Cindy's older daughters, Cindy herself, and even Richard, repeatedly enter and exit the frame. While music plays in the background, other family members just appear to go on about their lives. Cindy's teenage daughter repositions the camera at one point. The teenager also taunts Rika. The girl repeatedly repositions Rika's arms when they sag. She even does a weird dance, swaying her hips while repositioning Rika's arms. The callousness displayed by the entire family is beyond chilling. I want to stop here for a minute and really imagine what Rika must have endured during these torturous months in her father's house. While the mommy who loved her was nearby but just out of reach, the one man on earth Rika should be able to trust implicitly to protect her, to keep her safe, instead allowed this hateful woman to inflict unimaginable physical and emotional pain on her while he stood by and watched and even participated himself, while other children in the home were not only treated light years better than Rika, but also witnessed and even participated in her abuse. Can you imagine how alone this little girl felt? Can you put yourself in her shoes and imagine what it was like to stand facing the wall, arms outstretched, holding cans of food that felt like boulders in your little hands? maybe even standing there naked, wet, and cold, while other members of your family nonchalantly went about their day, or worse yet, hit you with their hands, kneed you in the back, slammed your head into the wall, berated you, screamed at you, and reinforced your belief that you were all alone in the world with no one to save you? Can you picture how much it hurt to be kicked in the stomach repeatedly by your real-life wicked stepmother? To feel something inside you tear? To know something awful was happening to you as you grew sicker? and sick her over a matter of days, but you couldn't say anything because no one would listen to you. I know that was a dark tangent, but Rika went through that. That was her reality. That's how she spent the last months, days, and hours of her life. On that grim note, the prosecution rested its case at the end of the day, and the court recessed for the weekend. Richard Roundtree, Cindy Baker, and Ann Simmons were all listed as defense witnesses, scheduled to testify on Monday, November 18, 2019. However, Richard spent the morning being interrogated after it was revealed that Cindy gave him a letter during a weekend visit, asking him to lie and take the blame for everything during his testimony. Prosecutor Mary Cole told the judge about the letter, and because of its disclosure, the defense chose not to have Cindy or Richard testify. That was probably prudent, because the prosecutor said that if they had, of course they would have been questioned about the letter. Anne was also not called to testify. The trial was delayed by about an hour that morning, while the court waited for a late juror to arrive. But by 10 a.m., the woman was replaced by an alternate, leaving a jury comprised of eight women and four men. During the single day it took to present its case, the defense called three witnesses, all of whom were staff from two of the three schools Rika attended during her short life. She was only enrolled as a third grader at Prairieland Elementary School for 12 days before she died. Rika's second grade teacher, Matthew Sharp, Sheridan Elementary School nurse, Holly Bialato, and Prairieland Elementary School teacher's assistant, Angela Brown, recalled no concerns about Rika's health. Mr. Sharp testified to some of the injuries Rika came to school with, such as her swollen lip in April of 2018. Both the teacher and the school nurse testified that during her second grade year, 
Rika went to the nurse's office about 23 times, which was considered more frequent than normal. Teacher's assistant, Ms. Brown, said she often worked as a breakfast monitor at Prairie Land, where she greeted students and interacted with Rika for the 12 days she attended the school. She said Rika was quiet. She wouldn't speak unless spoken to. Ms. Brown described Rika as often looking tired with her hair unkempt, while Cindy's then six-year-old daughter, who attended kindergarten at the time, looked neat and well-rested. Rika wore clothes that were inferior to the younger girls. Ms. Brown testified that she didn't notice anything out of the ordinary when Rika came to school on January 24th, which was the day before she was rushed to the hospital for emergency surgery. During closing arguments the same day, co-prosecutor and McLean County Assistant State's Attorney Erica Reynolds said, For most, it's unthinkable, but for Rika, it was normal. In the 407 Stanhope residence, Rika was treated as less than, as this defendant's punching bag and endured isolation, terror, and unimaginable pain, and her pain served as entertainment for the entire family. Rika, the prosecutor said, was battered and abused in front of every kid in this house. They treat Rika like a plant, maybe not, because you water a plant at home. Dr. Denton opined in his medical opinion that a child who has been systematically, physically abused develops the ability to cope with even the most serious pain. Although Ms. Reynolds did not believe Cindy intended to kill Rika, she said, Intent has no place in your deliberation. For a first-degree murder charge, the state had to prove she knew that her acts created a strong probability of death or great bodily harm. What did she think was going to happen when she kicked her? Rika's life didn't matter to this defendant, but it matters in this courtroom. Rika matters here. In his closing argument, defense attorney Todd Ringel said of his client, Those videos do not show aggravated battery. They do not show murder. They again show an offense that she's appropriately charged with. He said the videos were all from the family's Bloomington home and didn't include any images after the family's move to normal in December of 2018. Ringel added that if Rika was so badly injured, she wouldn't be able to go to school or participate in gym, both of which she did in the days before her death. He explained that Cindy didn't testify because, You've heard Cindy in all these videos. Her word isn't going to change. He added, Cindy has lied about using a belt and lied about kneeing her. But you decide whether the kick actually happened. Nobody knows when the kick actually happened. After closing arguments concluded, the case was handed to the jury for deliberations for about two and a half hours that evening before going home for the night. The following morning, deliberations resumed for another two and a half hours, after which the jury returned with a verdict. On all six counts, first-degree murder, aggravated battery, endangering the life of a child, and three counts of domestic battery, Cynthia Marie Baker was found guilty. We, the jury, find the defendant, Cynthia Baker, guilty of the offense of first-degree murder. It is signed by the four person and other 11 jurors. The next verdict provides we, the jury, find the defendant, Cynthia Baker, guilty of the offense of aggravated battery to a child. The next verdict provides we, the jury, find the defendant, Cynthia Baker, guilty of the offense of endangering the life or health of a child. The next verdict provides we, the jury, find the defendant, Cynthia Baker, guilty of the offense of domestic battery. The murder and aggravated battery charges were accompanied by exceptionally brutal or heinous behavior indicative of wanton cruelty, which meant those charges carried the possibility of life in prison. As the verdicts were read, Cindy finally showed some emotion in the form of self-pity, lowering her head and crying. Cindy's bond was revoked, and she was remanded back to the McLean County Jail to await sentencing which Judge Costigan scheduled for February of 2020. The day after Cindy's conviction, on November 20, 2019, a news conference was held at the Normal City Council Chamber at Uptown Station. McLean County State's Attorney Don Knapp said, I want to first say the State's Attorney's Office and the Normal Police Department believe this matter is an ongoing criminal investigation, that there may be others criminally culpable. He would not answer questions about whether Richard Roundtree would face charges. Normal Police Chief Rick Bleichner said, Today I've got a lot of mixed emotions while I'm extremely proud of the work that was done by our team and the partnerships that assisted in this investigation. I'm also sad because a young life was lost. And I'm angry. I'm angry because in looking at the facts in this case, it was so senseless, so unnecessary, it was so good. My hope moving forward is that from tragedy can come some opportunity, though. 
an opportunity to raise awareness, to educate, and as a community to stand up for abuse in all of its forms. I think it's worth repeating that this isn't the finish line. State's Attorney Knapp, his, his uh, prosecutors, our detectives and I believe that there's more work to be done in this case. Assistant State's Attorney Mary Cole said, Our goal is after this case is over um, that some legislative action can be taken in Rika's name because there are some very simple things that could have been done to prevent her death. The blame for her death lies on the person who was convicted. Um, But uh, no child should ever have to go through what she did. And so hopefully when all this is over, um, we can have some tough conversations about what can be done differently in the future so that her death is not in vain. The same day, the Normal Police Department posted on social media, Normal PD would like to thank all those who assisted in this investigation and prosecution. During times like these, it is easy to talk about the offender and their crime. However, let us all use this time to remember a life that was taken too soon. Rest in peace, Rika. The following month, in December of 2019, Cindy's sister, 31-year-old Victoria Baker of Varna, Illinois, was indicted on a single count of witness harassment, accused of communicating directly with Richard during the murder trial with the intent to harass or annoy him in such a manner as to produce mental anguish or emotional distress. It wasn't explicitly stated, but I'm guessing Victoria was leaning on Richard to take the blame, just like Cindy tried to do in her letter. Victoria was released after posting bond in the amount of $5,035. That same month, Ann Simmons was released from prison after serving about a year on her forgery charges and failure to complete her probation terms for her aggravated DUI. On January 3, 2020, a court hearing was held at which Cindy's new defense attorney, Phil Finnegan, requested a new trial for his client and asked for more time to gather information, causing Judge Costigan to vacate Cindy's scheduled sentencing for the time being. Outside the McLean County Law and Justice Center, Ann held a rally at which she and some of her supporters spoke making it clear that Anne opposed a new trial for Cindy and wanted charges filed against Richard and against Cindy's teenage daughter. They beat her, they killed her, and they burned her, and they forgot about her. My daughter didn't deserve any of that. I trust in the system that failed me to not fail my family. Every day it's like my daughter is dying again. Richard gets no sympathy, period. I went to court 101 times to get my daughter back. Children become afraid, and they don't want to talk because they have to go back to the abuse. No other child should suffer the way that Rika did, and I pray that people start to speak up. It is your business. Of Cindy, Anne said, She's guilty. She needs to just accept her guilt and just go to prison and start her time. Anne said of DCFS, Do your jobs. If one person had done their jobs, if any one person that gets paid to look out for our kids, look out for our kids. If you know something, see something. If a child comes to you and says something to you, do your job. If you're wrong, you're wrong, but at least you did your job. Do due diligence. Do your part. Rika told people, and because Rika was articulate and was able to speak, she wasn't taken seriously. Because Rika was able to come in and say, these things are happening to me in a way that wasn't how the book says it's supposed to look, it wasn't taken seriously. People that are mandated to speak on behalf of our kids, they need to either stop working in their jobs and let somebody come in that's going to protect our kids, or they need to do their jobs because Rika didn't need to die. They should have removed her from that house. They should have talked to her alone. They should have taken her seriously. She's got marks on her. What medicine cabinet falls and hits a child in the face like that? I mean, come on, do your jobs. I'm seeking full justice. Everybody that got up on the stand, because I wasn't there, but everybody that got on the stand and said they saw something is responsible for my daughter's death. I want to make sure parents don't have to go through what I went through. I want to make sure that, that my son don't have to continue to go through what he's what he going through. He should be home with me. We should be able to grieve and mourn together. Four days later, on the afternoon of Tuesday, January 7, 2020, Richard Roundtree was arrested on a warrant charging him with felonious endangering the life or health of a child under the age of 18 for circumstances surrounding the death of his minor daughter. Richard, whose only criminal history included several traffic violations, was accused of permitting Rika Roundtree to be exposed to and fail to protect her from ongoing physical child abuse that was occurring within their shared residence. This was a proximate cause of her death. After Richard's arrest, 
Normal Police Chief Rick Bleichner, said the circumstances of Rika's death remained under investigation. The Normal Police Department and McLean County State's Attorney's Office continue to work jointly, analyzing the nearly half a terabyte of electronic data, dozens of witness interviews and statements, medical records, and other information gathered in this matter. Anne reacted to Richard's arrest, saying, I want to know what happened. Like, when did he start hating my baby so much? Like, when, what did, what did my baby do to deserve what they did? And then how come, how come he didn't love her enough to allow her to have a proper service? Anne also said she planned to see to it that Rika got the memorial she deserved. The day after his arrest, Richard appeared in court via video conference, where he asked for and was granted a public defender. His public defender asked for Richard's $10,000 bond to be lowered, saying he had nowhere near that amount to post, but the request was denied. At a hearing later that month, Richard's public defender, Carla Barnes, requested a new judge in his child endangerment case, saying, He feels that you are so prejudiced against him and that he would be unable to receive a fair hearing if this case was to continue before your honor. Due to the timeliness of the request, Judge Young granted the motion for an automatic substitution of judge. Within a week, the question of who the judge would be really didn't matter anymore, as 31-year-old Richard James Roundtree pleaded guilty to endangering the life or health of his daughter and was sentenced on the spot to eight years in prison with credit for 30 days served. At the hearing, Richard's attorney, Carla Barnes, read a statement apparently directed at Rika's mother, Anne, saying, I should have protected Rika better, and I'm sorry. I want you to have Rika's remains, and I have been waiting for you to get out to have a funeral for her. I am truly sorry that we are having to go through this. Anne was permitted to read her victim impact statement, in which she said she was lost without Rika, and no matter how long Richard's sentence was, it would never be enough. You took my baby, my only daughter, from me to torture and abuse her. You took away a life that had so much love and imagination. Rika was my life, my twin, my little writer, but Rika was my princess. I feel like you deserve to die in prison. You are her dad. You were supposed to be protecting her from the pain that you brought to her. At a post-trial hearing on October 9, 2020, Cindy Baker finally took the stand, trying to defend the abuse found in those horrific cell phone videos. She tried to blame the fatal blows on Richard, and she claimed her previous lawyer, Todd Ringel, did not call witnesses at trial who saw Richard hit Rika. Assistant State's Attorney Mary Cole spent almost an hour questioning Cindy on the stand, especially about Rika's abuse and her part in it. She referenced several disciplinary actions they saw in the videos and that were mentioned in the text messages and asked her about each. Did Richard tell you to do that? Cindy answered, no, each time. During the hearing, Todd Ringel defended his trial strategy, saying it depended on his early assumption that both Cindy and Richard would testify which he had to abandon after the ill-advised letter from Cindy to Richard was uncovered. To this, Cindy said she only decided not to testify because Ringel told her if she did, they would lose. At the next hearing on November 19, 2020, Judge Costigan denied Cindy's motion for a new trial and thereby proceeded with her sentencing hearing. Defense attorney Phil Finnegan asked the judge to hand down a sentence other than a natural life term, presenting 11 letters from Cindy's friends and family that spoke to her loving and caring nature. Anne's victim impact statement included these powerful words. You took a promise of a better tomorrow. It's over with. Please stop filing motions. I'm tired of seeing your face. Please just go ahead and accept your fate. Can you please just be done today? That's all I want. You killed my daughter. You used her as a punching bag. You tortured her for no reason. You're sick and you need to go away. Assistant State's Attorney Erica Reynolds called Cindy's cell phone videos her own pornography. She said there was no other defendant more deserving to be called a monster for allowing other children in the family to taunt Rika. Cindy, she said, showed a complete lack of empathy for a dying child, playing for the court the excerpt from Cindy's police interview in which she explained that while paramedics tried to save Rika, she was worried about the girl vomiting on her new living room floor. You saw the damage done to her internal organs. Her body literally rotted from the inside, leading to a painful and agonizing death. While a brutal stabbing can be over in minutes, Rika suffered for days in silence and tears. Cindy, too, was allowed to read a prepared statement before the court, saying, I accepted Rika and I loved her as if she was my own child. I apologize for the things I did wrong, but I cannot in good conscience apologize for something I did not do. That's ironic, since this woman clearly doesn't possess a conscience at all. 
For his part, Judge Costigan said, I have yet to see a case where the evidence was as distressing to me as this one is. Nothing that child did or could have done warranted the type of abuse that was inflicted upon her. The demented idea that holding these cans out while naked and being beaten is some sort of acceptable punishment is very troubling to the court. That's not acceptable punishment. That's pure evil. With that, the judge sentenced Cindy to spend the rest of her natural life in prison, which means she will never be eligible for parole or release. After the sentencing, prosecutors Erica Reynolds and Mary Cole said they were pleased with the sentence. Reynolds said, I don't think there was a better candidate for a life sentence. The prosecution team said they hoped Rika's case would bring changes in how DCFS handled abuse investigations. Anne said of Cindy, She don't have no remorse, and a natural life sentence will at least keep the next kid safe. I think it's time for it to be over. I was ready for it to be done with. I'm very happy that they went with natural life. I'm very happy that he denied all the motions today. After the sentencing, attorney Phil Finnegan submitted a motion for a lesser sentence, and on December 8th, Judge Costigan denied the motion, affirming Cindy's life sentence. On Wednesday, December 9, 2020, a federal lawsuit was filed in U.S. District Court for the Central District of Illinois and the Illinois Court of Claims on behalf of Antoinetta Simmons, naming as its targets Richard Roundtree, Cynthia Baker, and six DCFS workers, Johanna O'Brien, Stephanie Moreau, Patricia Shannon, Mark Della Smith, Mark Orwall, and Daniel Norris. Anne is represented in the lawsuit by high-profile civil rights attorney Ben Crump, who also represents the families of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, two black individuals killed by police. Mr. Crump also previously represented the family of Trayvon Martin, a young black man shot and killed in Florida in 2012 by a self-proclaimed neighborhood watchman. Joining Mr. Crump in representing Anne in the lawsuit are attorneys Stephen Levin and Andrew Thutt. Mr. Crump said in a virtual news conference on December 9th that the eight people named in the suit violated Rika's constitutional rights by failing to stop repeated instances of abuse reported by the girl's mother and a school nurse. While Rika's abusers may be behind bars, we have not yet achieved full justice for this child. This baby was literally tortured to death. Mr. Levin said records show DCFS's reckless conduct started when, in 2016, they did not conduct a background investigation into Richard and Cindy, which would have given any sane individual pause before a placement was made, because two cases against Cindy found substantiated evidence of child abuse against her prior to Rika's placement in the home. Anne said during the virtual press conference, These are supposed to be people that are supposed to protect our children, and there's no way that you can look at my child before and after and tell me that everything in between was okay. I'm going to continue to fight and tell everybody that had a job to protect my daughter and didn't do it. I want every last one of those people to be held accountable. Kids are dying because you guys are not doing your jobs. And then I'm left in this position knowing that for two and a half years. Mr. Levin said, We hope this case and whatever verdict the jury returns is sufficient to wake up every state, every city, every agency in this country that there are consequences when you don't do your job. When they placed this dear child into her biological father's home, it was like putting a drunk driver in the seat of a speeding automobile. Mr. Crump said, Rika had to die before they believed she was in danger. And that is why we are fighting for Rika's legacy not to be swept under the rug, to try to prevent this from happening to any other children, especially marginalized children. DCFS was asleep at the wheel. Rika's tragic death was the direct result of the failure of several Illinois Department of Children and Family Service workers. No lawsuit will ever bring Rika back, but at some point, A line must be drawn somewhere telling the state of Illinois that enough is enough. That line is drawn today. The lawsuit alleges that overworked DCFS employees were urged to close cases quickly and to maintain a code of silence regarding sham investigations, falsified reports, and or disparate treatment of African-American children within DCFS. Anne and her attorneys have not specified the damages sought in the lawsuit. 
they are more interested in policy changes in Illinois' child protection system to prevent future tragedies like this. Mr. Levin said, The family is entitled to fair and reasonable compensation for the tragedy they endured. Cynthia Marie Baker, Illinois Department of Corrections inmate number Y43982, is housed in the Logan Correctional Center, a prison for female offenders in Lincoln, Illinois. This is the same prison where Joanne Cunningham, A.J. Frun's so-called mother, is serving her paltry 35-year sentence. Cindy will be turning 44 in September. Richard James Roundtree, Illinois Department of Corrections inmate number Y41394, is currently housed in the Shawnee Correctional Center in Vienna, Illinois. Richard, who is listed at 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighing 306 pounds, just recently turned 33 behind bars. His projected parole date is January 5, 2024. Cindy's sister, Victoria Lynn Baker, has not yet been tried for allegedly harassing Richard during Cindy's trial. Victoria pleaded not guilty to the charge in January of 2020, and currently her jury trial is scheduled to begin at 9 a.m. on Monday, September 20, 2021. Antoinetta Simmons got back together with her former boyfriend, Deontay Harper, after he was paroled from prison in August of 2019. The two married briefly, but separated in May of 2021. Anne, who now uses her daughter's last name, is working toward the creation of the Justice for Rika J Foundation, writing on her LinkedIn profile, I was put in the position of giving a voice to the voiceless. My daughter Rika Roundtree was murdered 126, 2019 here in McLean County after suffering chronic child abuse. My mission is to advocate for parents while keeping children safe. Many times the children that need saving are not, while children that are in homes that would benefit from supportive services are removed. I am working to create a network of services that would strengthen the home, empower the parent, and keep children in the home. I am working to make sure that when children are removed, they are kept in culturally correct homes and monitored appropriately. I'll include a link to the Foundation's website and Facebook page in the show notes. On April 17, 2021, the first annual Justice for Rika J. Play Day took place at Franklin Park in Bloomington in honor of Rika's 11th birthday the day before. On the Facebook event page, Anne wrote, This day of play is geared to remind us how precious our children are and why we must protect their innocence. It's Rika J.'s way to say no to abuse, yes to the joys, fun, happiness, and love of our children. It's up to us parents and caregivers to report all abuse. It's our business. Attendees enjoyed food, face painting, laser tag, live music, and other activities. Wearing a face mask in the midst of the current COVID pandemic, Anne told the pantograph of her plans. Okay, so tomorrow is uh, Rika's birthday. So, of course, um, it's a celebration. You know, Rika's Rika's life was a, a planned event. You know, she was planned pregnancy, um, we had to get her induced, so her, her labor was planned, you know. So there was a lot of planning that went on with this girl. So quite naturally, um, I was like, you know, we got to do something. want to do something fun. We've been under COVID. Um, I tried to do a memorial for her, COVID. Um, so I just wanted to do something fun this year and bring families together, bring the community together, bring people outside, um, and just have an opportunity to look around and see how important it is for us to protect the little people, protect our kids. We got to remember how precious their sounds are, you know, how innocent they are and how clueless they are to the dangers of the world. You know, it's our job to protect them as parents. And I'm just hoping that this event gives everybody an opportunity to just look around and remember, you know, the playfulness, remember the, just, we got to protect our kids. During the event, Anne told a reporter she didn't want to remember Rika's injuries, but instead, she wanted to keep close to her heart the memories of her loving, fun little girl. Her life was amazing. It's worth being celebrated. You know, her death was horrible. Everybody knows all about that, but Rika liked to have fun. She had so many years of just greatness left in her, so I just want to do this to just be open, show, show happiness. Anne also works with Labyrinth Made Goods, which, according to its Facebook page, is a social enterprise that creates opportunities that empower women who have experienced incarceration by providing professional development training, apprenticeships, and permanent employment as part of YWCA McLean County. To fund its good work, the company sells an ever-growing selection of beautifully scented soy candles, which are available to purchase at www.labyrinthmadegoods.com.
As I like to do as often as possible, I want to end this episode by remembering Rika. Rika J. Roundtree was an independent kid with a big imagination. She loved her dolls more than anything in the world, and she spared no expense to take the best possible care of her babies. She has been described as active, bubbly, smart, a hard worker, extroverted, and articulate. Prosecutor Mary Cole said of Rika, This case has always been about Rika for us. Uh, We are very sad that we never got to meet her, but we feel like we got to know her through this process. Everybody says what a bright, intelligent, spunky, spirited, funny little girl she was. And we are so sad that she's gone from our community. We will never forget her. On a GoFundMe campaign a friend created for Anne during the fight for justice for Rika, Anne posted a video of Rika sitting at the dinner table, wearing a pink t-shirt and a denim skirt, a big smile on her pretty little face while she sang an extremely silly song to her older brother using a wooden spoon as a microphone. Can you see something blue looking at me? I think Charles needs to put it on her. Rest well, Princess Rika. Your memory will live on forever. My sources for this episode were WVTM 13, News Channel 20, WGLT, People, 25WEEK, WCIA, LinkedIn, Central Illinois Proud, GoFundMe, Cities 92.9, the McLean County Court Public Access System, the Illinois Department of Corrections website, Woke America, the Justice for Rika J. Facebook page, the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services, and Johns Hopkins Medicine. That's it for this week. Join me next week when you'll hear my conversation with Rika's mommy, Anne Roundtree, who is one of the fiercest warrior women I've ever had the privilege of speaking with. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod and on Twitter and TikTok at STLC Pod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music, and all music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to SufferTheLittleChildrenPod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.